Hi, LES family. I am really excited to be here today. What I thought I would do is do something a little bit different. I'm going to try and see what it's like to be animated. Here we go. Hey, look at that. Now I'm animated just like all the other characters in our innovation classroom. Hey, Mr. McLaughlin, I am glad to have you in our classroom. What are we going to learn about today? Well, the whole reason I've decided to join you in this animated world is because today we are going to learn all about animation. And how does animation work? How does our brain see animation? And how can we make some animations of our own? So first, we need to look a little bit about how does our brain make animations work? And to do that, I have my friend Jeremiah Dickey, who's going to tell me all about how animation really works inside of our brains. Let's welcome our friend Jeremiah out to talk to us. Take a series of still sequential images. Let's look at them one by one. Faster. Now let's remove the gaps, go faster still. Wait for it. Bam! Motion. Why is that? Intellectually, we know we're just looking at a series of still images, but when we see them change fast enough, they produce the optical illusion of appearing as a single, persistent image that's gradually changing form and position. This effect is the basis for all motion picture technology, from our LED screens of today to their 20th century cathode ray forebears, from cinematic film projection to the novelty toy, even, it's been suggested, all the way back to the Stone Age when humans began painting on cave walls. This phenomenon of perceiving apparent motion in successive images is due to a characteristic of human perception historically referred to as persistence of vision. The term is attributed to the English-Swiss physicist Peter Marc Roget, who, in the early 19th century, used it to describe a particular defect of the eye that resulted in a moving object appearing to be still when it reached a certain speed. Not long after, the term was applied to describe the opposite, the apparent motion of still images, by Belgian physicist Joseph Plateau, inventor of the phenakistoscope. He defined persistence of vision as the result of successive after-images which were retained and then combined in the retina, making us believe that what we're seeing is a single object in motion. This explanation was widely accepted in the decades to follow and up through the turn of the 20th century, when some began to question what was physiologically going on. In 1912, German psychologist Max Wertheimer outlined the basic primary stages of apparent motion using simple optical illusions. These experiments led him to conclude the phenomena was due to processes which lie behind the retina. In 1915, Hugo Munsterberg, a German-American pioneer in applied psychology, also suggested that the apparent motion of successive images is not due to their being retained in the eye, but is superadded by the action of the mind. In the century to follow, experiments by physiologists have pretty much confirmed their conclusions. As it relates to the illusion of motion pictures, persistence of vision has less to do with vision itself than how it's interpreted in the brain. Research has shown that different aspects of what the eye sees, like form, color, depth, and motion, are transmitted to different areas of the visual cortex via different pathways from the retina. It's the continuous interaction of various computations in the visual cortex that stitch those different aspects together and culminate in the perception. Our brains are constantly working, synchronizing what we see, hear, smell, and touch into meaningful experience in the moment-to-moment -moment flow of the present. So in order to create the illusion of motion in successive images, we need to get the timing of our intervals close to the speed at which our brains process the present. So how fast is the present happening according to our brains? Well, we can get an idea by measuring how fast the images need to be changing for the illusion to work. Let's see if we can figure it out by repeating our experiment. Here's the sequence, presented at a rate of one frame per two seconds, with one second of black in between. At this rate of change, with the blank space separating the images, there's no real motion perceptible. As we lessen the duration of blank space, the slight change in position becomes more apparent and we start to get an inkling of a sense of motion between the disparate frames. One frame per second. Two frames per second. 
four frames per second. Now we're starting to get a feeling of motion, but it's really not very smooth. We're still aware of the fact that we're looking at separate images. Let's speed up. Eight frames per second. Twelve frames per second. Looks like we're about there. At 24 frames per second, the motion looks even smoother. This is standard full speed. So the point at which we lose awareness of the intervals and begin to see apparent motion seems to kick in at around 8 to 12 frames per second. This is in the neighborhood of what science has determined to be the general threshold of our awareness of seeing separate images. Generally speaking, we begin to lose that awareness at intervals of around 100 milliseconds per image, which is equal to a frame rate of around 10 frames per second. As the frame rate increases, we lose awareness of the intervals completely and are all the more convinced of the reality of the illusion. And now I've brought another friend along, Andrew Andy Bailey, also known as Andymation, is going to show us how to do flip book animation. I've been Take doing a lot of requests yes. to make a flip book tutorial. So in this video, I'm going to show you how to make these three flip books. And then at the end of the video, I'll show you some of the advanced options that I currently use. So this is what you're going to need, a stack of paper, binder clips, and a light source. For your paper, I recommend starting with index cards. You could use a stack of post-it notes or a notepad or, uh, you know, the, the corner pages of your math book. Um, but I recommend cards because they are thicker and much better to flip. We'll start with something super simple. I'm just going to draw a stick man and I'm going to have him wave. Now, the key to keeping your drawings consistent and matching from page to page is you need to be able to see through your current page to your previous drawing so that you can reference it as you draw your next page. So here I'm using a light and now I can see the previous page, draw over the top of it and make any changes I want. I'm speeding up the video here and again this is just super simple to kind of show you basically how it works. So I'm tracing over his body and moving his arm a little bit for each page. I'm going to make his arm go back and forth about three times here. And there are several options you can use for a light source. You could use a light box, an LED tracing pad. Um, if you had nothing else you could hold the paper up to a bright window. This light pad that I'm using is the one that I've designed that will be included in my flipbook kit. So again, we're keeping this extremely simple. Uh, I'm keeping the stick man's body the same and I'm just moving his arm as he waves. Okay, so now that I've drawn his arm going back and forth a few times, I'm going to have him just drop his arm down to his side and then I'll be done. So now you just wanna line up your pages and then you can use a binder clip to hold them together. You can get binder clips in different sizes. This is a large and a medium. And let's see how it looks. So if you've never made a flipbook before, this is a really easy first one to try. Well, that was a whole lot of fun. Now that I've been in the animation, I thought maybe I would show you how the animation is done. So let me pull this up on my screen. So this is the software I use. It is called Cartoon Animator. And what I do is I go in and I start with a basic template file. You might recognize this file as I pull it open here. It looks very similar to the room I'm in right now. And you can see when I open it up, I have our friend. I am Anthony Innovator on stage. So what I can do is I can move Anthony around and I can add in different kinds of actions to Anthony and the computer does it for me automatically. So instead of having to do all of the individual pictures like we have to do in um, the animation style of the flipbook or the animation style of um, stop animation or even in the animation style of cartoons the way they used to be done years and years and years ago what we can do is we can tell the computer this is the first picture and then we can go ahead and tell the computer this is the last picture and the computer will fill in all of the sequences in between so for example if i told our friend sarah stark coder that i just want her 
to do some kind of motion like stand there idly and just kind of hang out. All I really have to do is click on Sarah and tell her to stand there and she will animate all by herself. I don't really have to do much else other than that. Now I'm going to do the same thing over here for I am Anthony Innovator and he is going to do some kind of little animation where he's just standing around waiting. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to add in some sound clips to add in some voices for our characters. So let me see if I can do this. Get some sound clips in here. Oh, first I'm going to extend this motion. You can see I'm going to extend it all the way out through the entire track. So that way they're going to keep doing it through the entire little video clip there. And now I'm going to find out where I want to put this sound. Let me put Anthony and everybody in the center. So now I'm going to just add the sound file. And again, the computer is going to do something really cool for me. The computer is going to take the sound file and manipulate Anthony's Hello, mouth. HHS family. I'm really happy to say. So that way we can hear week. Anthony talking From and see Mr. his Logan, lips moving. An and the computer is going to do all that for us. And now we're going to add some talk in for Sarah Starcoder. And we just find a file and add that sound file into Sarah Starcoder. I can get the right file here. Oh, that's not the right one. Hello, NHS family. My there, name oh, is there we I go. Am Anthony. The There's Nader, I am. I am so happy to tell you all have a wonderful, wonderful week. And now we'll find Sarah. And we got to rewind it a little bit so she starts talking at the right spot. We don't want them talking over to each other. And I'm also going to move her off screen so that way she looks like she's going to walk on screen. So all I have to do to do that is I drag her off screen and then I'm going to add in the walk motion to Sarah. And then I'm going to position her at the final spot that I want her to, to be at. So I'm going to add that motion in. And we'll go with this motion and you see the computer has added that in. So now she has this walking motion, which we're going to carry through the entire track. And now I've drawn in a path for her Hello, to follow. NHS family. And now she just I follows the path Anthony and walks Innovator, along the path and, so and comes into the room. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. And I've used some perspective by changing her size. So she looks like she's walking from the back of the classroom to the front of the classroom. Rewind her a little bit, add in her sound file. And my oh, that's name my Sarah voice, Starkey. not Sarah's voice. Let me fix that. Try this again. And my name is Sarah Starcoder, and I would like to echo that of my friend I am and say, have a great week. Good cheer, everyone. So that is the whole process that I followed to make all these cartoons. Well, it's not exactly the process I follow. I do do a little bit more to make it um, a little bit more interesting. So when you are deciding to do your own kinds of animations, what kinds of things might you want to do? What kinds of things could you do? Well, for sure, you could try to do a flipbook animation. So you could draw a little picture and you could find a light source. You could use your um, a laptop or as a light source. I know people have done that. Just don't press too hard. You could use an iPad. That's a good light source or an iPod or an, some kind of other smartphone is a good light source that you can lean on and draw on. Or like it was suggested in the video, you could draw it on a window on a nice sunny day and you can make your flip book that way. So if you happen to make a flip book, I would love to see your, your video of you doing a flip book. 
Well, LES family, I hope you enjoyed that, and I look forward to seeing your videos. Have a great day, and keep innovating.